Lucian Truscott, welcome to uh, Muller Time. How are you, sir? Glad to be here. Uh, so the reason I want to talk to you is you're the your salon.com's chronicler of the really the Trump Russia story, along with, of course, a best selling author and journalist. And I, I was wondering if you could just maybe take us through uh, as briefly as you can the, the Trump Russia story uh, uh, up to here. Um, well, I'm doing right now. Uh, I don't know whether you saw my Wednesday column route, but it was part one of a retrospective. Mm. So uh, it's <laughs> taking us through the Trump Russia story. I know. It, you know, it's, it, I mean, I started in 2013 for that, and now I'm, whoa, well, I'm way up to 2014. Yeah. And uh, but I can, uh, yeah, it's, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll give you a tease of what that column says today um the um uh, I, I'm fo I focused in on March the 6th 2014 uh in fact I just I ended the last column sort of on that date and so I decided well I'll pick it up again and what I realized is is that that's the day that that two things happened one Obama impose sanctions on Russia for seizing land in Ukraine and, and Crimea. And the second thing was Trump gave a speech to CPAC praising Putin again for about the sixth time since 2013. Uh, not, Trump was not an announced candidate yet, but it was clear that he was already running for president. He was, a, he was appearing at the CPAC convention and what did he decide to do there but talk about oh, what a great guy Putin was and how Putin had given him a president. And then he would go on over the next several months to give other speeches. And practically every time he appeared anywhere, he was saying something wonderful about Putin. And I, what I realized is, is, that, is that, you know, law enforcement people, prosecutors have an old adage that when it comes to crime, there, there are no coincidences. And I think we learned from Trump and Putin in 2016 that when it comes to American politics these days, there are no coincidences. Uh, it's not a coincidence that Trump was praising Putin on the day that Obama sanctioned him for what he did in Crimea. Mm -hmm. And I think what we, what we saw in 2016 was and, and, and what we didn't know, what we didn't know, on, and what I'm really doing in this retrospective thing is, is doing what fascinates me about the Trump Russia story is not what we know now, but what we didn't know in 2013, 14, 15, and 16. There's so much that we didn't know that was going on behind the scenes that's now been uncovered. But the fact that we didn't know it colored our politics. And what we didn't know on that day was that, um, uh, that uh, what Obama didn't realize was that he would be, he, he was um, setting the stage for how the presidential election two years from them would not only be fought between two American political parties, but be interfered with by a foreign power with aided and, abet and abetted by one of the candidates in the, prudential, in the presidential election, which was Donald Trump. And the aiding and the abetting uh, 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 all dates back to that one day when, tr when, when Obama sanctioned Russia for, um, for uh, its transgressions in, in the Ukraine and Crimea. One of the first things that happened later in 2016 that we that we know about now, but we didn't really understand and see, you know, with as clear eyes as we have now, was at the at the um, at the convention in July of 2016. The only thing that the Trump campaign did, other than corral delegates was to 
And the only influence it sought to it sought to have over the platform, in other words, what Trump would really be running on, was to change the the Russia plank and the platform from condemning Russia for what it had done in Ukraine to letting them off. And this 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 should have sent us. We should have we should have gotten the signal right then that that something was up. We should have gotten the signal by then that every time Trump opened his mouth, he was saying what a great guy Putin was. I mean, these quotes that I looked up for Wednesday's column about what he said about Putin were just <laughs> astounding. He was asked, "Who is the better leader, Obama or Putin?" He said. There's no contest. He said it, it's Putin. He said he he runs circles around Obama. I mean, it, it, you know, this guy, this guy was praising Putin up one side and down the other. And Putin, um, the minute he got sanctioned, took a look around and said, what can we do about this to get these sanctions lifted? And And one of the things that they decided to do was seek to influence Donald Trump. And it was public, wasn't it? I mean, that's, I read your column, of course, and there's a Twitter, there's a tweet, uh, will Putin be my new best friend? It's not like this was all, it's a conspiracy in plain sight in some ways, no? Yeah, it was, but we, we couldn't figure out back then what that was all about. Hmm. We, we didn't have a clue. Hmm. I mean, I remember going, what is he talking about this? <laughs> well, what other presidential election have we ever had where one of the candidates spent time constantly praising uh, 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 basically a foe of the United States, especially an, uh, an anti-democratic autocrat like, you know, like Vladimir Putin. I mean, this is, it, what would we have thought if he was running around saying all this, the, the same kind of thing about, about, uh, about the, the leader of North Korea? Or, or the leader at that time of Venezuela. I mean, you know, they, they, these are, this was, this was craziness. And of course, of course, that Putin was not really, other than what we saw happen with Ukraine, Putin was not being treated like a, like an enemy of the United States. And I think that if you look back to the election of 2012, one of the mistakes that Obama made was. When, in that famous debate when, when Romney was asked, what are what foreign policy challenges and what national security challenges do we face, you know, that are the hardest and most important and everything? And he said, Russia. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the audience laughed. And and, and Obama sort of blew it up, blew it off, you know? And and um so so that gives you an idea of the way we were looking at Russia and Putin only one year before this or two years before this, um, uh, the sanctions were imposed in 2014. I have a question for you. That's what, what sometimes keeps me up nights is, as you said, the public and even, even investigative journalists like yourself, we, not all of us knew what was going on, but what I don't understand, why didn't our, our government, our intelligence agencies, are we supposed to believe they didn't have, they didn't know who Donald Trump is, and why didn't they take action in some way? Or I, I don't know. I don't. I don't get it. Uh, they, you know, they, yeah, they didn't know. I mean, it, uh, Donald Trump was not running around committing um, national security violations uh, with foreign adversaries all over the place. The idea of wanting to build a tower in Moscow, there's no law against that. Trump, Trump built one in Azerbaijan for crying out loud. I mean, he wanted to be, if somebody would sell him a cheap piece of land, Trump would throw something up on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there was nothing untoward about wanting to do business in Russia. He, in 2013, he had his, uh, his pageant over there. That's so true. they weren't running around surveilling him or, or do anything like that. So, you know, we didn't have any reason to, to, to suspect anything. When we got a reason to suspect um, something was up, finally was, and this is where you, you can get into the criticisms of 
not only the intelligence community, but the Obama administration mm. is April of 2016 when uh, Papadopoulos sat down with this guy Mifsud mm -hmm. in London and Mifsud returned from a trip to Moscow where I met with senior Kremlin officials and they told me that the Russian government has dirt on Hillary Clinton and has her emails and they're willing to share them with the Trump campaign. Mifsud knew he was talking to a an official of the Trump campaign, however, mm -hmm. however lowly Papadopoulos was. Although, I don't think that if I was appointed a foreign policy advisor to a presidential candidate, I would really think that I was in a lowly position. Yeah. Uh, I would think I'd be pretty happy about it, you know, and I think Papadopoulos was. I think Mifsud was pretty happy about finding him and yeah. and and using him. And at that point, um, it was only a short time after that that Papadopoulos went to that London hotel and blabbed to the Australian ambassador or something like that, that, the, that he had learned that the Russians had dirt on Hillary Clinton and they were going to use it. That guy picked the phone up and called the FBI. And the FBI, shortly after that, opened up a counterintelligence investigation that encompassed that ended up well began with Papadopoulos and Carter Page and then ended up being a counterintelligence investigation involving the Trump campaign since they were officials in the in the Trump campaign. Well then then the question becomes and I think what you're getting at is how come how come we didn't know about this? We didn't know about it because the Obama administration didn't tell us about it. Well, most most presidential administrations don't tell us what their intelligence agencies are up to. But in the summer of 2016, Obama had a meeting with the so-called, and his intelligence chiefs had a meeting with the so-called Gang of Eight, that two, the four top leaders in the Senate and the House and the four the chairman and the ranking members of the Senate and House intelligence committees sat down with them and said, this is going on. We, we know these things are happening. We, we've got information that the Russians are fiddling around in this election. And that was when, when um, McConnell infamously said, well, if you release that information, we'll attack it as a as politicizing the the politicize. I guess politicizing the intel the using intelligence politically, and <laughs> I guess politicizing the election. I mean that yeah. it seems to me that elections, the purpose of elections is to politicize stuff. Yeah, and I don't, I, I don't see how Obama and his people thought that there was anything wrong with letting everyone know in July or so of 2016, whenever that happened, that Russia was interfering with our, with our election. Right. Yeah. They didn't have to say they were interfering with their elect with the election by contacting a guy in Trump's campaign. Right. They didn't have to get that specific. Right. They wouldn't want to anyway because they had him under surveillance or whatever. They certainly had, uh, um, you know, wire cover and all that stuff on him. Yeah. What I find myself thinking about is, um, you know, it's just another to complete national security catastrophe. Like, did you see the article about um, this? The Trump administration is monitoring journalists. It's called Operation Secure Line. It was on NBC. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. You mean on the border? Exactly. Of course. I, I keep finding myself thinking about our government always tells us that they're trying to protect us. Yet in twice in my lifetime, or at least as an adult, there's been two catastrophes, the Russia thing and 9-11, where the red flags are going everywhere. And the leaders don't. It's like they're dro they drop the ball. I, I don't. Yeah, I, you know. I don't understand it either. I mean, I, I do sort of understand the 9-11 thing because it 
it came out that uh, that the real screw up about that was all of that turf battle between the various the cia and the fbi and the nsa and all that that they were all jealous of each other mm -hmm. so they didn't share information and so the fact failure to share the information is what l led to failure to uncover this conspiracy that was happening right on our shores you know? mm -hmm. they should have been able to share that and figured it out and and at least and stopped at least part of it if not all of it um but i you know, my, I guess my cynicism was a lot deeper than yours because mine goes back to COINTELPRO back in the the Nixon administration where they had wiretaps and, and surveillance, FBI, military intelligence, and other intelligence surveillance on on the anti-war movement and and journalists and all kinds of other stuff. I mean this and all kinds of other people they, these are not new things mm. you know they the, the the government you know violates these laws and norms and stuff periodically when people get in the government that are prone to do that sort of thing yeah. um, even you know i mean the bush administration had this stupid patriot act and all of that kind of un you know, unauthorized, warrantless wiretapping and all that stuff. And then Obama got in and he didn't, I can't remember exactly, but he didn't really seek to like completely undo all of that right away. I mean, it. one of the things about government and about power is when governments exist and when people come into power, they tend to use it rather than, than diminish it. Yeah. You know, they're seduced by it. And um, that's what happens. It even happened with Obama. It happened under Clinton. It, happened, it certainly happened under Nixon and Bush and, and um, you know, and, and Trump. Uh, so, you know, the, you know, the, the thing, I guess the thing that really fascinates me about the, the Trump-Russia thing is, like you were saying, how much of it was sort of right out in the open? I mean, at least hinted at, you know, the, the Trump's fascination with Putin, his praising of Putin and everything was right out in the open. And when he said, Russia, if you're listening, get these emails, that was right out in the open. That should have been sending bells off. And it did. I mean, Hillary Clinton stood up in a debate and said, yeah. Putin likes you because he wants a puppet, you know. So, and Hillary Clinton, but but she didn't take that and make it a centerpiece right. of of her campaign, right? You know, and I mean, all of this in retrospect, you can say, well, she made a mistake, but but also, but in retrospect, uh, I think it's understandable that it didn't look like the bit as big a deal as we know now that that it was i mean we know now that we know now that 17 people close to trump associated with trump or on his campaign had more than 100 encounters on the phone or email right. or in person with russians no we collusion. didn't know that then <laughs> Hillary Clinton didn't know that then. Nobody yeah. knew that. We didn't know that Michael Flynn was meeting with the, and talking with the Russian ambassador all the time. We didn't know that the Trump campaign was meeting with the Russian ambassador. We didn't know during the transition that the Russian ambassador and Russian bankers were going into Trump Tower and having meetings with Jared Kushner and people like that. Mm. We didn't know any of these things. We didn't know that Eric Prince was flying over to the Seychelles to have a to try to set up a so-called back channel with Russians through the Putin's buddy that he met with over there. We didn't know any of these things. And um, but you know we know them now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and. And and I think and a lot of what we know now has come from journalists 
burrowing and figuring out what, what, what's been going on. And, um, and of course, I think that, I mean, you've heard this before, but, you know, we, we suspect that Mueller knows a lot more than we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, how he's going to handle that information, what he's going to do with it, how many more indictments he's going to bring, what he's going to say in his so-called report, um, what that information is going to end up, what effect that information is going to end up having politically. I think we could guess at, but um, we, we really don't know. You know, um, If I were to guess, I don't think anything Mueller does or says is going to affect the Donald Trump's support one iota. I think that Trump is somehow he's he figured out a way to nail down this whatever it is, 40% of the general public, but basically 30% of the general public in what they call, you know, his solid he can do no wrong base, you know. And uh, and he does it by xenophobia, racism, all the various stuff that you've heard about and, uh, and all of that. But and he does, and part of the way that he does it is by constantly saying, look, they're picking on me. Mm. You know, they're having a witch hunt. And I'm the object of it. And, right. You know, and um, so I don't know, you know, I don't know what what these things, what Mueller is going to find out. And I, I don't really know what the Democrats are going to find out, but I'm really hoping the Democrats don't do anything more than just have some people in and bring them before the committee and turn the cameras on and question them and get information because it's too late for them to go after impeachment. You know, you got to remember where we are right now. It's March of, of, of 2019. We are only one year and like two months, three months from when from the date that that Trump announced for president in in 2015. Mm. You know, I mean, these the calendar is inexorable. You know, it's running, you know, while we're diddling around looking at at you know, trying to figure out what's going on and everything, the calendar's ticking away, and the can and the presidential campaign is coming. I mean, um, no matter what Mueller comes up with, all of that stuff is going to be is fodder for the presidential campaign at this point, not for some sort of impeachment inquiry. So, in other words, in terms of um, uh. For those of us who don't want to see any more of this, you you'd think it would be better just to vote him out as a one termer rather than impeach him. Well, I don't think that there's any choice. Yeah. Because impeachment takes, you know, if they were to impanel an impeachment, and the Judiciary Committee start to like staff up, they've got to hire staff and all that stuff, mm-hmm. and and start investigating, and then start calling in witnesses and all of that kind of stuff. Hell, they do that for the rest of this year, mm. you know. And by that time, you're in, you are in the year that the presidential campaign begins. I mean, the presidential campaign is underway. Yeah. How many Democrats have announced? Uh, Twelve or something. Trump is know. going out on rallies, Christ, weekly. Mm. You know, it, it's underway. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I just, I don't see how anybody, I don't know, I don't care. I don't know what these kind of these people think that are saying, oh, we need to impeach him. You know, it's we missed that chance like about a year ago. You know, I mean, it, it, they would have had to get all that going a year ago and they couldn't do that because the Republicans were in power. So the fact that we just took over the House and can now impanel the impeachment committee or whatever means essentially that we took over the House too late. You know, and uh, it is what it is now. It seems like, well, the next, I think at least for the next 10 years, long after he's out of office, there'll be investigations and probably indict. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of lawyers are going to be very busy. Uh, And uh, I'm sure you and you and I will both have a lot to talk about in this. You know, I don't know how, how much we'll have to talk about 
because once once Nixon was out um, out of the presidency, they they ran out the string of prosecutions that they had on Nixon's people. I, I can't remember how many people were prosecuted. Sixty some. They got you know a whole bunch of convictions. Once they once they ran that out, it was over. You know, and and if Trump gets beaten in in 2020, um, it may be that there are still investigations of criminal behavior by his company in New York and that sort of thing that'll that'll go on. Um, but um, I think that they're going to beat the you know they're going to beat they're going to use up all this information in the presidential campaign. And um, if it doesn't work to help beat him, then it's then and and, and and God forbid if the Republicans took gained back the House or or held on to the Senate, nothing will happen. Nothing. We we wouldn't be talking about anything because yep. nothing would happen and there wouldn't be any source of information to come out. You know, special prosecutor would be finished. You know, it's a, it's a, it's. It's horrible to think of, but it's an yeah. actually, you know, a real possibility. Uh, I know, I know you you got your column to write today, so I just want to maybe ask you one or two more questions, and then it's off to the races. Uh, do you think that this was a uh, a Manchurian candidate kind of situation, where oh. literally, or or just a coincidence of? Or, no, or, the thing that that I'm lo- that I've been looking at, you know, I started looking at Wednesday, and I'm looking at today is okay. sort of. The question of what came first, the chicken or the egg? Exactly. Um, and I think what came first was Putin. Okay. Um, I think um, I don't think Trump sat down and thought to himself, um, "What can I? How can I use Putin to get elected? Or what kind of crimes can I commit to get elected?" I don't think that he. he you know, I, I think that when when crimes presented themselves. He took them. Okay. He committed them, but I don't think that there was some kind of sustained conspiracy to begin with. Sure. Or or a or a plan to on Trump's part to en- engage the help of Russians and and others and commit crimes in order to to get elected. And I'll tell you one reason I don't think so. It would take an enormous amount of rigorous intent and knowledge and and cleverness and skill and everything else to do that. And if you if if there's one thing Trump isn't, it's rigorous. <laughs> if Trump was rigorous with his business, he never would have gone bankrupt. Yeah. You know. And um and I don't think that there's any evidence that he expended any more of that kind of intellectual firepower and, you know, in running his campaign than he did in, in running his business. So I think that, I think that what are the, what is, what's the word that they use about Trump all the time? He's transactional. Uh You know, if, when, when transactions present themselves, Trump takes them. The way he ran his business, if you go back and read Tony's book, and if you listen to anybody that knows anything about him is Trump would sit in his office and answer the phone oh. and take meetings. You know, he people came to him and said, Hey, are you interested in building something in Azerbaijan? Sure. Yeah. You know, he didn't I, I there isn't much evidence that he that he like made big plans other than some of the stuff that he did you know, years ago, like build Trump Tower and that sort of thing. But he gave up on those kind of major big things that are self-generated and then went to that model of sit there and wait till somebody calls you from Panama and says, hey, we want to slap your name on some condos. How much do you charge? And he said, this many million and send me a check. You can have my name. And then if you want, you can sign up my management company to run them for you. But he didn't go down there and build them. You know, he Easy just money. took the opportunity when it came, you know. 
So I think that that's sort of the way that he did the, 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 the his election campaign. And when Russians started not, and it was Russians that knocked on the door. I mean, Papa, I don't think Papadopoulos was out running around looking for Russians. Mm. They found him through this guy, Mifsud, who I think is just a classic example of a GRU, either active agent or agent of convenience or, or influence. You know, where the way that those intelligence agencies and our intelligence agencies operate is they put agents out there that in in basically in embassies and so forth and they go recruit little guys like Mifsud to run around and look for shit for them and they pay them for it i'm sure that that's pretty much the way Mifsud may have makes most of his income is by calling them up and saying hey i ran across this trump guy what do you want me to do oh okay come to russia and talk to us so he flies to Russia, and then they sit around and have meetings with him for five days, and then they send him back, and he says, hey, we've got this information we're willing to share with Trump. Go ahead and tell him in, in New York that we've got it. And then they call up Trump's people, and Trump's people go, oh, my God. And instead of calling the FBI, as we know, they go, what can we do to use it? You right. know? Yeah. They're, they're just transactional with it, you know? They all have the same. It's ironic, right? They all have that in common. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that Trump's innocent. Yeah. It just means that he is what he is. You know, he, he's crooked. He's he's more likely to take a, a, a criminal proffer mm -hmm. than, you know, say, than Romney would be or, or, or any of the other guys that were running against him, you know, Cruz or any of them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but I don't think that he was out there actively pursuing, um, you know, uh, the Russian government. He was just willing to accept their help when it when it came his way. Yeah. Well, you yourself said. No, no, it's it's. I agree with you. I don't think it's. I watch a lot of movies too, but no, I think it was a, uh, like Gary Webb called it, the uh, journalist, the Dark Alliance. They just. Everybody, their interests come together. Uh, uh, and you yourself said when, uh, as reporting abroad, when a man approaches you with, I think you said in Beirut, it's not a, not somebody you would be wanting to spend time with. with I, no, I mean, it. those guys are everywhere. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I got approached and, yeah. and, and shit, what was I? I was like a 27-year-old village voice writer. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I was like a Papadopoulos without a portfolio. Or without a political portfolio, at least, you know, and uh, and but, you know, they're they're constantly feeling around and trying to find ways to influence stuff and, you know, doing that kind of thing and and, um, you know, there's, there are, there are places in London and Paris and Vienna and Beirut and places like that, that when you walk into them, every other guy is some has some kind of a scan of a thing going on you know yeah i mean they, they look like they're just having a drink at the bar or sitting at a table with a couple of pals having hors d'oeuvres but what they're doing is sitting at the table and and having hors d'oeuvres with somebody that they're that they're saying hey what is your company up to you know and the guy says oh well you know we're really looking for this gas deal and then uh, they get the back to their room and get on some secure line and say hey i ran into schmucko down there in the, in the lobby and he's looking for a gas deal for azerbaijan or whatever and then they take that little piece of information and salt it away you know it's yeah it, it, it's you know that this campaign was the first time that that world intersected the political world in our experience is there a, uh and again i know you have to go write your column is there any teaser you can give us for uh the next column or for salon or uh Anything well, I just gave you the lead, yeah. you know, that about the coincidences thing. Yeah. You know, and it, 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 um, I mean, I'm basically what I'm gonna, what I'm doing in this column is, um, I realized doing the column for Wednesday, I, I, it, when I was finished, I went, oh my God, this guy is just running around talking about Putin all the time. Yeah. 
management. I also realize that that I don't think we know as much about Putin as we ought to. Mm. You know who he is, what kind of guy he is, how did he achieve power? What kind of power does he exercise? And uh, what is it that he wants to do with this this mm. power that that he gets? You know, it's you know that that's the big one of the big hints with Putin is how how powerfully he reacts to the sanctions that have been imposed on him. the the um, the thing about the United States is that the United States is not just another foreign country to a guy like Putin. Mm-hmm. The United States is the place where banking transactions are the, the nexus of banking tra- international banking transactions happen in London, New York, and Paris, and that and that's about it. You know, so if you lose New York, you're losing a lot. The other, the, another thing is that the United States, if you lose, it, you, you know, this is a sanction we haven't imposed on Russia, but let's suppose that we decided we do it. Our FAA could say, you don't have landing privileges for airplanes coming from Russia anymore in this country. Think of what that would do. Instead, what we've done is we've said the following people don't have landing privileges here. The following people can't access bank accounts and move money through these banks and through our system. And the following people that we that we sanction when we do that is his buddies, and and um, and they limit his ability to project power. And not only that. If you look at it domestically, part of the way that he keeps himself in power in Russia is by keeping those kinds of guys happy. Because mm-hmm. those are the kinds of guys that if they decided we don't like Putin anymore, could get together and start some kind of a political party or movement or whatever and try to take power from them. So Putin keeps them happy by, by lining their pockets. When you take away the the mechanisms by which those pockets are aligned, then you're hurting him. And that's why he's so upset by this action that we think of, we don't really think of as being as significant as it is, these, uh, this idea of sanctions, you know. They're very, very, very powerful. And they're powerful because of what the United States is. Well, listen, uh, Mother, uh, Mother Time listeners and myself just want to thank you. And uh, if there's anything you ever want to, you know, come back, give us the inside scoop on, we'd, we'd certainly love to hear about it. Well, I mean, if you got, if you see something that I write, you want to know, you know, where that came from or whatever, call me out. Because there are things that, there, are, there are, I'm sure there are things that I've said in this broadcast that aren't going to find their way into something I write. Okay. I'd love I to keep. I can't keep enough of it in my head. To put it. <laughs> I yeah. really, I can't. Yeah. I can't. You know, it's yeah. it's it's uh, part of it is a function of of how enormous this story is. Yeah. And the other part of it is, I'm 71. I'm not 27 anymore. You know, when I was 20, when I was covering Watergate. My brain could contain a lot more info than it does right now. <laughs> I don't know. You seem to pack a lot into those columns. I think you're. I think you're doing great. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, look. Thanks again. And uh, I. I guess we'll. Uh, we'll see how this plays out, won't we? Okay. All right. T- take care.